Right, what joys have I got for you today? So, we are going to be talking about chapter 14 of um, JavaScript for R. Um, we are, um, in this chapter, we learn about the, um, basically the, 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 the workflow that you have to go through in order to um, add a, a kind of a, a custom output into a Shiny app. So, um, so you, you learn how do you um, construct the data that is required by the output? How do you um, um, render that data into such a form that you can transfer it from the server side that's running an R process to the browser side where JavaScript's going to interact with it? And how you um, ensure that the data that you transfer over to JavaScript is hooked up to the appropriate bits of HTML in the app that's presented in the browser to the user. And I, I mean, I must admit that I did get a bit lost uh, when I initially worked through this chapter because it seemed like there was an awful lot of processes going on and very little kind of explanation of how everything gets hooked together. Um, and it's this, the, the, the section that we haven't, that I didn't quite get to last week, which is section 14.6 on the JavaScript output binding, which kind of ties these threads together. So, um, hopefully you can see my um, book notes on the screen at the moment. Um, do let me know if you can't. Um, oh, hold on, I have to open the chat. And there's always lots of chat going on that I never know anything about when I present it to camera. Um, right. Um, yeah, so, so the topics we're going to talk about today are the JavaScript side issues of how you, um, for a custom output that you, that you want to add to a Shiny app, how you ensure that that, uh, the, the, um, the JavaScript side of your app, the part of your app that is running in the user's browser can find the data it needs, put it into the appropriate place in the app and, um, you know, ensure that the user can see everything. Um, so last time we talked about how to set up this thing, how to generate the, the kind of um, initial R side data structures that you need to um, uh, send over, over the wires. The, um, the scaffolding that you need to put in place on your app uh, sorry, in the HTML, in the DOM of your app, such that your output, be it a plot or a table or something like that, um, such that the data that you transfer has somewhere in the DOM where it can be put for presentation. Um, and there was a file, is that right? Uh, oh, sorry, I think I've just duplicated something here. So um, the thing that we're working on, though, the example in the book uh, generates a um, what they call a boxy output. Um, and um, do I have a, hold on, where am I? In? So what I've done, in, in, in contrast to what goes on in the book, I've made a package where that boxy um, the, you know, the output function, the render function, and the, the, the kind of R side function that generates the, um, the, the, the data that will be used by the, the boxy thing. I put them all into a package. So that package 
encodes its own dependencies and things like that so that it would be easy for me as a shiny developer to use it if i ever needed something that that does this thing i can show you what it actually does uh no, hold on um i'll pull a different thing over and where are we Lord. okay so i've what i've got here this this project is a, a typical R package. So I've got um, a script here that defines uh, a couple of functions that relate to generating this 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 output. Um, I've got you know installed directory. I've got man pages and things like that. This is a typical package. Within it, I've added some uh, an example Shiny app that will dis demonstrate how to use this boxy thing. So the code at present is the, the 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 kind of translation of the code in the book into package form, um, and I can show you what happens when the the, the code runs. Um, so if I run that, that basically adds a box like this to an app. Uh, I can show you the code for that app as well. Um, is it that one? No, that's the more complicated one. Um, so I've got two shiny apps in here. One's more complicated than the other. So this is the thing that I've just shown you. Um, so it's just a single row within which there is a output function, it, you know, an, an output element into which a uh, this, this this box has been is is being presented to the user the kind of the animated thing where it runs up from 0 to 95 when you initially open the app that's something that is um, animated using a dependency called count up um, so um, so that's what it looks like at the end of the chapter, basically. Um, and that's kind of what we're working towards. Um, right, so uh, if I try to move in the wrong things all the time. Okay, right. So let's get into this. So the... the um, oh, no, that's the wrong thing. Um, we talked about the render function last time. Um, what we're going to talk about here is the out, what they call the output binding. And that is code that you write in JavaScript that is handled by the, um, the front end side of Shiny. Um, so what this is, an output binding is a JavaScript object that tells Shiny how to find the appropriate component in which to put your output data or plot or whatever it is that should be presented in the app. And it also kind of tells, tells um, uh, you know, how to, 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 to interact with that component. So, um, so finding the component, there's a, a method that you have to define to do that. Um, what I mean by interacting with it is like, when the data changes that feeds into this output component, what should happen on the JavaScript side? Um, you know, which elements need to change their value, which things need to be, um, you know, reran and, and whatnot. In the R there's an RStudio article on building outputs, which isn't nearly as detailed as the, the, the chapter that we're working through. But it does say something that is exceedingly important, which I found exceedingly confusing when I was working through the book. Um, the output component is a JavaScript object, okay? You construct a single one of those output binding um, objects for each different type of output that you produce. You don't generate one for each instance um, of, of your outputs that you... Uh, oh, sorry, did someone... 
So it's just told me that you can now see my screen. I hope you could see it before. Maybe someone dropped out and came back in. Um, yeah, so this is really important, right? So we're defining a JavaScript object now, um, which defines how, when it receives data from R, what it's going to do with that, how it finds elements on the page into which that data should be put into. You have a single one for each type of output that you, or each type of custom output that you are defining rather than a output binding for each different element. Um, and the way that you define, oh, I'll show you the RStudio uh, article if I can. Okay, so this was written eight years ago, but a lot of the stuff that's in it still holds. Um, there's another one related to next week's chapter on building inputs as well. Um, so much of what we did last week is is the first half of this. So you define how to that you define your render function, and you define an oh where is it? You define a um, output function that makes the HTML skeleton. And then you have to write this JavaScript output binding object. The methods that you need to define uh, find and render value. Most of the others have a kind of default method defined for them. Um, but it's, it's actually quite a good little uh, it kind of complement to what's in the book, this, this um, um, page. Right, we'll get rid of that. Um, Okay, so, so we're going to make a shiny output binding. The default methods for these, for this, for, you know, the, the, the class are find, render value, get ID, blah, 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 right? You definitely have to define a find and you definitely have to define a render value. Um, and what they do, uh, the find method finds all elements on the page or, you know, in the tree below a given element. All those elements that are of an appropriate class or an appropriate form for attaching one of your output, um, one of your custom outputs to. Render value tells JavaScript when you receive a new batch of data from R, this is what you are going to do with it. Um, all the rest of them kind of, the, there's already default things. So I'll, I'll show you how to define find and render value for the boxy thing that we're working on. Um, so the first thing we did, the first thing we do is define an object to hold a shiny, an output binding on the JavaScript side. So I've put this in, in the package that I've built, I've put this in, in slash assets, slash binding.js, next to the count up .js and next to the CSS file that we've got in that package. We have to define a find method. And the way we do that is using this $.extend, which is jQuery's kind of way of taking the um, um, the the kind of keys defined in this object and appending them to this object. So like there may be a find method already be def defined for this object. If we have a find method in this object, and we call $.extend on target with that object, then the find method defined for that will be appended to and potentially replace the find method that was originally on this object. Does that make sense? It's, it, 
it's syntax I hadn't actually seen before in, in JavaScript because I don't use jQuery that much. Um, but anyway, that's kind of what it does. So you start off with this object and then you effectively attach a new find method to it. So what we're going to do is you take the scope, it might be a page, it might be an element on a page. Um, and within that, we're doing a jQuery search to find anything with the class dot boxy. And why is it we're doing that? Um, the reason that we're doing that is because the output HTML for the boxy thing that we're defining uh, looks like this. So we've got um, the boxy output function that you would put in your UI in Shiny creates a, a little HTML tree that looks like this. The main thing has the class boxy, and then there's two internal nodes which have a kind of boxy dash value and a boxy dash title as their classes. Um, so we're trying to find all elements. The find method we're defining is trying to find all elements on the page that have this class because assuming there's no conflicts in the names and things like that, all those elements should be uh, should have been generated by this boxy output function that you've put in your shiny UI. Um, where are we? Um, oh, sorry. So yes, find. All it does is find elements on the page. We'll assume we're talking about the page um, that have the class boxy. So that will return an array of elements of HTML elements on the page. Um, Russ, a, quick, a quick question, um, if yeah, I yeah, may. Um, yeah, I, was, I, was I had this question. I was reading through the chapter. I was hoping you you had um, clearer understanding than I. So, so this kind of scope bit, um, you know, there's nothing that seems to be passed to the scope. Is that just kind of by default the whole DOM? Uh, I guess in principle you could limit it to a, like a segment of the DOM, but uh, is it is that is that your understanding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think in. A, um, I'm not entirely certain what sub elements of the DOM you might typically pass. Maybe a, a maybe a module identifier or something like that within you know if you've got a, a shiny app that, that's partitioned or something like that. Um, or maybe if there's you know a visible element on the page, um, maybe it's just the subtree of that element or something that that is um, checked. The actual ins and outs of, of this are, seem quite complicated to me. Um, I can actually show you, um, if I copy that, I shouldn't have closed that browser window that I had open. Um, the, this is the, the, the kind of, the shiny, the, you know, the front end shiny um, source code for an output binding. So you've got all these different methods. You see that there's these throw things. Um, so you definitely have to define these two things. Um, the scope that's passed in, it says that it, um, it returns an array that contains all elements that match whatever your particular query is that you use there um, that are sub elements of the, the the scope that's passed in so um to me it would make sense if it was acting on you know on elements of the on like uh, uh, sub elements of a module or sub elements of a particular part of the tree that um but i i i i, I don't know in, yeah, in, in uh, I mean, at, at the risk of injecting another question that mm -hmm. kind of yeah. maybe comes comes a little little later, is um, kind of when when I saw how this was implemented in in, in the book, I, I kind of my mind immediately leapt to something Lucio said some while back that uh, you know he he'd noticed in practice that some um, some uh, some HTML widgets um, would seem seem not um, in, 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 
would, would seem to kind of have some kind of interdependencies. Uh, they wouldn't be kind of isolated instances mm -hmm. here. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering like, you know, in this case, like how we would avoid that, I guess you'd maybe have to, I don't know, I'm thinking, just thinking off the cuff here, like have each instance of, uh, of, of like, let's imagine we had a, a box, you know, several boxy boxes on, on the, in the UI, right. Somehow have, um, so as it stands right now, I think, I think that, you know, you'd, you'd return, um, a list, a list of all elements in the page that have the boxy class, right? Mm. Um, so, in our particular case, you know, which is just you know like a toy case, there's there's only one, um, yeah. but there may well be multiple ones, right? And so then, I guess either you have a different query um, uh, uh, that that somehow more narrowly targets an instance of a yeah. of a widget. <laughs> What or, I, found, I looked, I looked into the oh, source okay. code in quite a bit. Uh, I mention it a bit later in the the, the book notes, but um, yeah. So there's, um, so what happens is, um, maybe like, or I don't know how frequently this happens, or whether it depends on you know UI changes or something like that. But what happens uh, on the browser side? Um, each of the output binding objects that are registered with Shiny, um, the the browser will run some run that find method for each of those output bindings, and then you end up with a, an array of elements for each different output type in your app. And when it's got that collection of things, it will then associate the appropriate render value um, method with the appropriate element. It will do this kind of nested iteration thing so that like you as the developer, you only write a single output binding for your given output type. And Shiny kind of automatically knows how to link you know, if you send the data for a particular element over, Shiny will be able to determine precisely which render value function needs to run for that element. It won't have to run, you know, the find method again and, you know, filter them to check that the element you've passed is the same as the element that Shiny's passed, it, that R has passed over the wires or something like that. I, uh, I thought it was yeah. quite neat the way it, it actually worked. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I, I guess that's where in like the render value function that'll that'll come. You know, the, there's a reference to an element, right? So this mm. uh, this this find find method could return potentially several several elements, yeah. and then it also kind of like it operates with with an ID that would be then unique to each element found, right? So I guess there's some way of somehow indexing each instance. Uh, of of you know like a container on the page that that's of the desired class yeah 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 no uh yeah it's uh, yeah i agree um it's I, it took me it took me as a bit of a surprise to be honest that the code was written this way but i i think the way i imagined it working would have meant that you'd end up writing um or initiating a separate binding object for each element that you each you know of your outputs that you send to the front end i think um anyway um so what have we got here so we've defined a find method and that's important to to you know find elements appropriate elements on the page um you also have to define a method for getting the id the you know the html identifier for a given element so all the other methods apart from find work on an work with an element as their you know first argument so render value accepts an element and and um, on value change accepts an element and stuff so Th those methods know precisely which component of the DOM they should be acting upon, updating, and things. Um, this is just a method that you need in order to get the, you know, the HTML identifier for a given element, and it will either be um, da, 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 
uh, it will either be if the element itself doesn't have an identifier, then it will try and pull out this data input ID. If it doesn't have one of those, uh, sorry, if it has one of these identi uh, these attributes, data dash input dash ID, it will pull that out. Um, if it doesn't, then it will pull out the identifier for the element. Um, that's like the kind of default defined within Shiny. Um, for all for for the example we're using here it will use the identifier um so it will be um whatever it was um it will be id equals a fantastic box will be passed in it will will be returned as the the um identifier into which you if if this was the element you were working on. Um, okay, so let's get to some more interesting stuff. Um, right, so the output binary. Right, um, yeah, you also need to define this render value method, which is quite, quite important. We'll talk about it in a bit more detail further down the page. And you also need for that you need to register the output binding with shiny so if you um if we go back to the page that i had earlier on no it's not the code definition it's this one if i pull that out the there's a kind of a quicker view of the kinds of things that you have to write in here oh sorry maybe i've made a mistake there yeah, you have to. Um, hmm. Sorry, I'm, maybe I've mistaken myself. I thought there was a better example than that. Um, right. Um, so I'll show you the example. Um, so what we need to do, if I pull this back over, um, so that's just my app. That's just helper function and that's the R code. So at present the R code knows how to set up um, the HTML skeleton. It knows how to to serialize and transfer the appropriate data for JavaScript to work on. What it doesn't know is how to link the received data with the elements of the app um on on the browser side um so the way you do that is you define an output binding you define the appropriate methods to find the necessary elements on the page and for how to couple the received data to those elements to you know to a given one of those elements and then when you've got that output binding thing in place, you can then call this, which is how you tell the, the kind of global shiny object, this is a new output binding that I want to use within my app. Um, so um, make sure you know about it, basically. Um, the, I'll, I'll take you through these steps one at a time. So where am I? Right, so we, um, yeah, so if I put binding. Right, so the initial version of this code, following the book's workflow, we define this find method. And that just pulls out the appropriate elements of the, the um, finds the appropriate elements into which to put this, the, you know, that are relevant to this output line. Um, if we then, but we want to be able to, um, uh, we have to send um, a title for presentation within the box. We have to send a number up to which the, the count up uh, library will count in that kind of animated box. And we have to be able to pass in a color that 
um, will dictate what the box will look like at the end. Um, so if I pull out There, this is basically what it looks like. So we have a render value function that we're going to define that receives an element and some data. So the data is the kind of serialized bits that it's received from the render boxy function that's running on the R server side. Um, so, um, so the I mean, the code that goes in here is, is, is quite simple, really. So you just take the, um, the title component from that data object. You then find, um, so with the elements identifier, um, you the elements identifier, you construct the um, the sub element of that uh, uh, of this into which the title will be added. Um, so if you look at um, what was it again? Um, that was this element here. Um, so for each element ID, you've got this ID into which you're going to put the title. And uh, for each element, you're going to have something like this into which you're going to attach the, the, the kind of count up animation thing. Um, that's simply adding some plain text. Um, here, this is just the code that you need to call in order to make use of the count up uh, library. So with that, you, you need an identifier into which um, the, 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 the count up animation is going to be added. Um, you pass that identifier to the count up function along with a starting position and a, a final position. So this would be like an integer that the user passes in on to to um, oops, what have I done here? Boxy. So the R user would pass a title in here and a value. The value would be an integer or something, and that integer is the thing that count up counts up to. Then you call counter dot start. All that is is th that's not generalizable. That's just code that you need to call in order to make use of some JavaScript library that's being used for this example. Um, and similarly, we can set the background color of this element um, using this code here, element.style.backgroundcolor. So we've only defined two methods. All the rest we've inherited from Shiny's version of output binding um, then then into this output bindings um, object we're going to register our new custom javascript output binding object um uh, one quick question russ before you go to the registering the bindings mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, maybe it's just maybe a reminder to me uh, uh, um but I, I, I noticed in the JavaScript here, you know, we're 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 basically passing the values um, that that exist in this data object. Um, where did we create the object that kind of is is, is data? Is this just a generic name, and and how shiny, you know R slash shiny passes things over? Because I remember in the boxy function, not, not it was quite, just constructed no. as a list. It, it, yeah, like yeah, it yeah. wasn't so serialized it, in any way, yeah, or, so or we defined as we did in the widgets in the past. Boxy will do, yeah, a box and then 10 and then gosh right that will create a list that looks like this if we then pass that into render boxy i don't know whether this will actually show up in uh properly no it won't um if i then do maybe 
No, that's not quite right. Basically, what happens is this render function here, um, if I pull it, where is it? Is the function that's responsible for um, for ensuring that the 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 data that you want to pass over to the front end is formatted appropriately and you know sorry I mean serialized appropriately. Uh, Got it. So so, so this in principle would be where where that would where that would happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. But because because the the data that we're transferring over is relatively simple, we've not had to do any anything complicated with it for the serializer to work. Um, that's my understanding, at least. Okay, um, got it. Thanks. Um, okay, so follow me. Um, da, 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 da. Yes. So what have we got here? Um, so this is, we've got to fill in the render value method. We've done that here in, in the code I've just shown you. So, um, we've got, um, the boxy output when that's evaluated, create some HTML, um, boxy itself just makes a list of data. And with that data, we want to pick out the appropriate elements and attach them to um, and, and basically tell JavaScript how to attach those values to the HTML skeleton that we've put together. Um, and it's this render value thing here that, that does that. So um, the actual, I think the code for defining the render value thing is relatively simple, but that render value thing, that will run every time you, if, if you're defining a Shiny app, um, and using a custom output like this, that render value method there will run every time you change the data associated with a given output in, in Shiny. So um, if you've got, uh, where was the app? Um, so if I've got a, uh, I've lost it. <laughs> God. <laughs> Perfect. Um, now, what was it again? Boxy, right? Um, inst shiny examples boxy. No, that's not it. I've lost it. Let's go here. I don't, I don't quite understand why I've lost. Um, anyway, um, yeah, that render value method will get called every time you change the data that's transferred to javascript um which happens when a, you know in response to changes in your shiny server side um right where was i here but all the stuff um and the code to register that binding uh with shiny is quite simple as well so we, I showed you that in the source code. This second argument um, is mentioned in the book. It's actually completely unimportant at the moment. It's not even used by Shiny, but it's kind of, um, you have to give it a kind of a unique name such that um, if it ever gets used in the future, um, it, it's available. But, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to be made use of anytime soon. So. What have I got here? So that that's effectively it. We've defined how to make the data in R, how to serialize it, where to place it, you know, a skeleton within which to place it, and the code that for a given element on the uh, and on what the user views as the app. For a given HTML element within there, how to um, connect the serialized data to the, um, the 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 elements within that you know the sub the subtree of that element. Um, 
Yeah, so what did I do here? Unlike the book, I made a package. And that, w that was more so that I could learn how to do this so that I use it in the setting in which I would probably use it um, rather than like just following the example in the book because um, if I'm spending time to, to learn this stuff, I might as well <laughs> spend time learning how to do it uh and and deal with the the, the issues that might arise on a day-to-day -day basis in, you know at work um because you know i would typically write this kind of stuff in a package so that it could be used uh elsewhere um so in the book there was a standalone app it just had a kind of app.r um a, a single pay a, a single file shiny app and it had a couple of assets things so the the count up javascript file the um the binding.js were all in this and they were um served to the running app um in the package i've got a bunch of r functions in slash r i've got um the inst directory contains the what were the assets from the, the standalone app and um but otherwise it's it's almost identical um but i'm able to install it and um attach the the you know the contents of that package which mean that you know i can now um if you actually look at the source code for the um for the for the books example all of the kind of um the the um where are we usage books and usage here so this is the the code in the book why did that change um books and usage here so all the functions that i've kind of placed inside the package are up at the top level here uh, in the app.r file oh come on mate i'll never quite get used to um the uh <laughs> to where i can and cannot click on a, a book down thing um no, that's dependencies. Um, boxy usage. Yeah, so this is the full script. So you've got a couple of functions that you define, and then you've got um, the a UI component and a server component that uses those functions. The um, the binding.js thing is still the same as it is in the package, but it's like, you know, it, it's in an assets directory here rather than an install directory in um in in a, in a package we're going to generate this so the code will look identical except that these functions don't need to be defined in in my app so if i try and um work out why my package is no longer accepting that it's a package um where are we open project So where am I? Um, right, so uh, if I pull out main, okay, and then do dev tools load on, and then run example. Now there was a single Oh, what was it called? So this is the simplest app that I could have made, which just has a single one of them on. And the code for that, um, oh, the code for that is, you know, appropriately simple. Um, I can also run a more complicated version of the app. 
like so and it you know you get the animations on each of the different things there's no kind of you know one of the widgets doesn't not which one of the outputs does not interfere with the other outputs and that um okay and the code for that is almost identical to, to that in the book except that I load up the package that i've written and um i don't have to define these functions anymore um so, I mean, doing it as a package, probably an academic exercise, really, but I thought it was quite useful. Um, so that's that. So we've defined all the kind of skeletons of everything that we need in order to define a custom output and then shown how to use that custom output in um, a shiny app. A shiny app. Um, there is a little bit more to it did i did i actually write the code in here um no right okay um where are we yes so there's there's another section of the book which is quite interesting but i haven't put many notes on it because i didn't think i'd get time to talk about it um where they explain that some of these dependencies that are used by the custom output that we've defined um, may be pretty heavyweight. And if you're defining something like this for maybe, I don't know, um, to run in you know, restricted circumstances, or if just, or if you simply don't want the animation to be shown in certain settings, it's useful to be able to um, provide a kind of, provide an argument that will prevent the animation from running when the, um, when the, boxy output is added to a shiny app so um the, there could be many different reasons why you might not want to animate that thing that you've spent ages working out how to build the animated version of um so the formatting's a bit odd here um at present though and and that's quite easy to do you can put a switch into uh the the boxy function which will add an extra field into an, an extra entry into the the list that it produces, um, which will have an animate equals false attached, and then you can use that animate equals false in the render value method. So, for example, um, you might um, where's render value here? You might have if animate is false. Uh, sorry, if animate run this code, if animate is false, um, just show the, you know, the hard code, if, just show the um, plain text of, of the number. Um, that's quite easy to do, but, but if you do, if you do have a switch that works like that, um, you are still transferring the dependency for count up to the shiny app so the 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 actual kind of transfer over the wires is still as um um still as it was and that doesn't make sense if you're if you're sending um a dependency that isn't being used by the app you might you know be um putting a constraint on someone's network access or, 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 or the memory available to their browsers or something like that that, that you know you're, you're trying to avoid so um, you need a, a more subtle way of injecting the dependencies such that you can turn them on and off uh, su such that you know if the dependency isn't actually going to be used by your code the dependency isn't transferred to the browser um, Hopefully that makes sense. Um, 
So, um, so what was the solution that it got to? Can I just change the formatting of this because it looks hideous? Um, well, what's the use of injecting dependencies? Right. I think all I have to do is that and that. And it should look a bit better in a second. Um, yeah, so um, where the proxy or render value are used in the proxy output. So the the solution that they came up with in the book is rather than encoding a fixed set of dependencies to transfer in the boxy output function. So if we actually look at the um, the the source code for that at the moment. Oh, um, oh yeah, no, it'll be fine. It encodes the HTML dependency for count up and binding and styles, and transfers them all over. That's encoded uh, irrespective of whether the count up .js is going to be used. And that's as far as I got with the package. Um, but in the book, they talk about uh, a, a more subtle way of encoding the dependencies, such that rather than doing it in the boxy output, you can do it in the render function. And rather than have using HTML dependency, the, um, the HTML, uh, sorry, attached dependencies from HTML tools to um, add uh, a, the, the, the fixed set of dependencies to the, 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 the web page. You can use um, this thing here, create web dependency, and then use shiny.render dependencies. So what will happen here, so that rather than using this within the boxy output function, you um, use this workflow within the render boxy function. So how it works is you define an HTML dependency within this function that contains those dependencies that are kind of optional. Um, you serialize those dependencies using this, and then in your in the the you know in the play in the file where you what the equivalent to the binding.js that we had in the boxy package. Um, within there you run shiny.render dependencies. And you can run that contingent on whether the dependency is to be included or not. So for the boxy example, it would be whether the boxes should be animated or not. Um, and obviously you have to tweak some of the logic to account for that. But uh, I didn't want to talk about that in much detail because I knew that I'd end up talking about the, the, the binded object stuff for ages and ages and ages. Um, yes, but I thought that was quite an interesting way of uh, ensuring that, you know, that the dependencies that you send over to the user are as lean as possible for the version of the app that they are going to run. If a dependency isn't going to be used, don't transfer it. Um, so that's that. And then there's a little summary. Yeah. So what we've done here, we've created the data that you wanted to use, then serialized that for transmission to the front end. Separately, we created an HTML skeleton using this function that also defines the dependencies that need to be transferred such that the output can, can work. Um, and within those dependencies, you have to tell the front end side of Shiny how the data that you've transferred should be used within that output element. Um, so in order to do that, you need to tell it how to find those elements 
and for each of the elements how to render the output version of the the the, the element um given a, a set of data um yeah i thought it was a quite it was quite a cool chapter to learn i, I imagine i repeat myself an awful lot when i'm doing these talks and uh, i imagine people <laughs> watch them at twice the speed if they can but um i thought it was quite a quite an interesting um view into some of the the inner depths of what shiny does um that I, you know i hadn't actually looked into in much depth i was quite intrigued by that output binding thing there was another bit that i wanted to uh, is it bindings um output adapter here um there's was it this thing no it wasn't this thing it was bindings registry i think yeah so um the when for each output binding that you define and and in the next chapter each input binding that you define you 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 tell the front end of shiny to attach it to a effectively to a list of output bindings or input bindings and um this kind of the oh maybe I'm, maybe it's the wrong one um i think i've pulled out the wrong bit of the shiny source code but um um you can see within the source code for each element how shiny is telling it for this element this is your render value function and and and, and so on and so forth i thought it was quite neat um yeah but i hadn't really looked into the um it's actually typescript the the, the shiny front end code but anyway sorry um well, Russ, kind of for like a general treatment on on, on bindings and, and and such, um, have you have you found any good entry points for the kind of those uninitiated? I mean, it, you did a lot of sleuthing, kind of between, uh, kind of like triangulating between the book and uh, the um, shiny documentation and the shiny yeah, shiny yeah. source code. Have you found any kind of best entry points, or or, or is the best is the best way the way of the way of pain? <laughs> <laughs> um I, I didn't find a particularly good i didn't find a particularly nice simple example of how to do this um but, but i think that might be so the there was the the building outputs page which to be honest was now now i've looked back over it seems a little bit terse to be honest um and though it fell, filled in some gaps as to what the the, the chapter taught me, um, it, it it didn't help as much as just looking at the shiny source code. So what I was what I was doing was like um, uh, um, I was going through these things and like finding where's that in the shine in, in github on, on shiny and where's that on shiny and um <clears throat> and where are these things imported into other files and what do those other files do with these things and stuff like that which is the way of pain um there may be good tutorials on like you know how to write your first output binding f to do something much simpler um yeah, um, but I thought I don't know. I mean, I, 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 even if there was a simple tutorial, I think I'd probably be reading into the weeds and overcomplicating <laughs> things. Um, uh, <laughs> this seems to be my way. Uh, in yeah. These, uh, in well, these, no, I mean, it's it's a great way to go, I guess, provided that uh, provided provided the way of pain isn't too painful. If I can, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, in the sense that like the source the source code is is is, is readable, you know, given what you know about yeah. you know how how the how the the, the language used in the source code works. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah so um so next week it's a similar length chapter the input bindings one i think and um i think it might end up spreading over two weeks as well because it's okay 
uh, yeah, just because of the the amount of content in there. Hopefully, it'll feel a little simpler after having done this chapter. And the, yeah, fingers the, the crossed. subsequent ones are on cookies and how to use HTML widgets and stuff with, with Shiny. I think these two chapters, the custom outputs and the custom inputs, are the ones that will be of most value to Shiny developers with, within the book, at least. Um, so I make no apologize for <laughs> reading too much into everything, because <laughs> that's probably going to help me out in the future. But uh, exactly. next week, you're going to do the input bindings one, aren't you? Uh, that's right, yeah. And I haven't given a careful enough look at it yet to see whether it, it would be best done over, over the course of two okay. weeks rather than one. But I, I guess as I, I dig into it a little bit more deeply, I'll, <clears throat> I'll let you and the, the group know since cool. I know the kind of the downstream timeline will, will depend a little bit on, yeah. um, uh, on that. Cool, yeah. Um, in two weeks' time, I won't be able to be here. Um, and depending who is here, I'll get one of you to introduce the other. Um, and uh, because I'm, 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 I mean, I'm not the best organizer of people, but I'm like, um, now I'm kind of co-organizer for a local kind of data science meetup thing for which we've got like one speaker and I think we'll end up the, the two organizers doing talks. Um, yeah, so I have to do that, but I'll, I'll only be doing these things every two or three months so I'll, I'll be continuing to do the book clubs and stuff um yeah, those weekend. those those things from what i can discern from the outside end up taking uh far far more time at least at, at inception you know than you might expect i'm, I'm trying I'm, I'm hoping to get something started uh at work uh to yeah. group together kind of you know our people or, or these data sciencey people that are kind of yeah, yeah. peppered around the organization and uh i i've i've not gotten into it for that very reason i fear for how much time it's going to take uh, yeah yeah i did i did try to do like a our users group a long time ago in in glasgow um because I, I i mean i was working there but I, it was it one of these weird academic settings where you end up being like two programmers in a you know a hospital campus with ten thousand staff or something you know and uh it was quite hard to build a community in in that kind of setting but um yeah so i tried to set up an our users group for the, the whole city but it, it it was the weird things that that i found difficult i could find people who wanted to come i could find people who wanted to talk but i couldn't find somewhere to house them you know um anyway yes so uh next week um we'll be discussing input bindings and i'll leave it in your good hands to do that but i, I will be here next week but not the following week anyway i have a toddler uh, i have a three-year-old who's like shaking the door next to my computer so i really <laughs> got to go yeah lovely to see you again and uh right, Lauren left a while ago but uh anyway see you later bye all right bye-bye <laughs>